You don't have to wash your hands. I have so much time to myself. Hey, walk away when I'm talking to you. My kids really respect my privacy. When this timer goes off, please turn it off and do not tell me. Thanks. Here, can you use up all my battery? Don't call me when you get there. I don't wanna know where you are. It is just too quiet in this car. Okay, we're about to leave for church, so if you're gonna make a huge mess, you better do it now. I don't know, your dad usually does everything around here. All of these people are such good drivers. Eating dinner is completely optional. Hanging up your towel is completely optional. Flushing the toilet is completely optional. Okay, this time, can you smile more like a crazy lunatic? Hey, you wanna dig through the fridge for the fifth time today? I'd definitely rather be here than at the beach. I am loving the look of these chips on the floor. I am loving the smell of your feet in my face. I am loving this back pain. Get a massage, ew, no thanks. Take anything you want from my closet and don't worry about putting it back. Don't look at the camera, look over there. If your sister takes your toy, just give her a good smack on the head. Hey, come drink that grape juice in here on the carpet. It's dinner time, everybody come get a snack. Hey, did you know you can wear the same pair of underwear all week long? Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> and happy Mother's Day. After that, I don't know if I need to say anything else <laughs> at all. I imagine that for many of you, that video brings back all sorts of memories of times when important women in your life have said the exact opposite of what she said there, uh, and uh, memories of uh, maybe, maybe things that didn't seem so humorous at the time, uh, but, but now do. That video that we just saw reminds us of all that we owe to our moms, to grandmas, to aunts, to teachers to mentors in our lives, and indeed to all of the ladies who have impacted our lives over the years in so many different ways. Not only have uh, these ladies at times provided us with the gift of humor, but ladies, you have also taught us valuable life lessons, like not leaving chips on the floor, not putting our feet in other people's faces, and not smiling like a crazed lunatic in those family pictures. Now, now, some of us are maybe still learning some of those things. We've got a little ways to go, but hey, there's always next year, right? Now, last Sunday, Pastor Aaron started a new sermon series for us. We're talking about this idea of, of interwoven, uh, th this, this metaphor using quilts and other things that weave different elements together. And this is a springboard for looking at the way that Jesus has and is about the business of weaving us all together with our distinctions, our differences, our different gifts, and making us together into something new, something vibrant to the family of God, His new creation. And so each week we're considering a different element, a different piece or color or thread of this tapestry that God is working on. And today, of course, in recognition of Mother's Day, it's appropriate for us to talk about the role of women woven into the family of God, bringing blessing and life and God's good gifts to those around us. We're celebrating today not just moms, but indeed all women in our lives and the wonderful gift that God has given to the church and to the world through females who bear his image. And so this morning, we're going to consider the foundational truth that to be female is to bear the image of God in a marvelous and wonderful way. And to illustrate this principle, we're going to take a look in a few minutes at Jesus' visit with sisters Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. And there we see the very heart of God revealed for them and for us today. But before we do that, let's ask the Lord to meet with us here and to bless our time in His Word. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning that you are not a God who is silent, but that you have spoken to us through your Word. Lord, meet with us this morning. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to receive what you have for us today. During this time, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
Now, as you know, friends, there are many, many different voices in our culture saying many different things about gender and about the role of women today. So it's crucial for us in all of our conversations, but especially in this one, to begin with a firm foundation in what God's Word has to say to us. And it, frankly, doesn't get any more foundational than Genesis chapter 1. Here in these verses, we find for the first time described the remarkable gift that God has given to the world through his image bearers, both male and female. And so today we're looking especially with an eye toward these female image bearers. And and we see this on the sixth day of the creation week. God has already created many things. He has first created the realms of the heavens, the sea, and the skies, and then the dry land. And, And then he's gone on to populate these realms with celestial bodies, with fish, and with birds, and then with land dwelling creatures. But before he declares this act of creation complete, And before it moves from being simply good to very good, there's something else that God intends to make. And so picking up at Genesis 1, 26 through 28, we read this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So, verse 27, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And even though everything ahead is worth reading, we're going to stop there and we're going to take a look at what this tells us. What do we see here that informs our understanding of how females are interwoven into the holy and good purposes of God? First, we see here that the fullness of God's image is too vast and too big for just one gender to display alone. Men bear a piece of God's image, yes, but women also bear a piece of God's image. And together, we as male and female capture more of the fullness of who God is. Together, we show the world what God is like. We also see here in these verses that both men and women receive the blessing of God and that this task of ruling, filling, and stewarding the earth is given to men and women together. Women, therefore, have no less a role to play in the governing and developing of God's creation than men do. This is a true partnership. And so it appears, then, that what God has in view in this final act of his creation before he declares it very good and rests is that in the creation of male and female, he has brought about a vibrant partnership, a partnership that showcases the same kind of love and solidarity that the three persons of the Trinity share. Partners who are fully equal, yet express their personhood in distinct ways, who submit to one another in love, who seek to honor and to please one another, who together bring blessing to each other and to those around them. And this pattern that we see here is not just reserved for married couples. No, this is bigger than that. It's, this is how men and women were created to relate to each other in general in the world that God made. But sadly, as we know, things rarely go that way in our fallen and sin-riddled world. The Bible contains numerous instances of how we have failed to live up to this calling for which God created us, male and female. The Bible gives us an honest and at times a hard look at a world in which women are all too often taken for granted or treated as a means to an end, seen as objects for men's power and pleasure, are abused, neglected, disrespected, and undervalued. And that's not at all what God intended for us. 
So we must stand firm against such evils in our world today. We must at all times and in all places uphold the scriptural truth of the full dignity, equality, and worth of all who bear God's image, both male and female. But for this reason, we also want to celebrate those glimmers of hope that we see in the Bible. Because in spite of all the ways that we as humans have desecrated the God-ordained trinity emulating biblical partnership between male and female, the Bible also shows us many, many instances of female resilience, of godly women who have overcome hardships in their lives and have allowed the light of God to blaze brilliantly in and around them. Throughout the pages of Scripture, we see how God has raised up women of valor and virtue to bring his blessing to a broken world. In the Bible, we meet women who bring God's blessing to others as wives, as mothers, as businesswomen, as prophets, as judges, as missionaries, as farmers, as household managers, as heads of state as advisors to kings, as shepherds, and as kingmakers. We encounter women who use their gifts for mentoring, for praying, for leading, for teaching, for guiding, for healing, and for speaking truth into all kinds of situations. We find women who are spiritual trailblazers, who see and who forge a path forward following God in difficult times. We see women who take risks that bring their families and their nations closer to God. We see women cultivate spaces of blessing for others and treasuring up knowledge, faith, and the identity and values of God's people so that this lived memory of the purposes of God can be preserved for generations to come. We meet sisters in the faith who possess a spirit-filled vision of what God is doing, a heightened spiritual awareness and an insight into unseen realities, who, who can peer into human lives and situations and discern the needs of the moment and the aches of the human hearts around them. We find courageous and faithful spokeswomen for God who serve the Lord, at times by calling men back to obedience, at times by speaking truth to those in power, and at times by fixing the mistakes that the men in their lives have made. We also see women who stand up against injustice, who literally strike death blows to tyrants, who do the things that need to be done at times when no one else seems willing to do them. What we see in the Bible is a rich story, and we see that no one-size-fits-all model is before us for how a person, male or female, is to serve God. Instead, every sister, every mother, and every daughter has her own path to take as she listens to the voice of God and follows where the Spirit of God leads her. And the same is true for men as well. As the body of Christ and as the family of God, we all win when both men and women are following Jesus wholeheartedly, serving him with everything they've got and releasing their God-given gifts, abilities, and passions into the world for the glory of Christ. As Christians living in a culture that in so many ways has been influenced by biblical ideas, we can easily forget how revolutionary the teachings of Jesus in this area are. But, but lest we forget, not everyone holds to a biblical view of the dignity, worth, and gift of God's female image bearers. For example, just this week in Afghanistan, as many of you are aware, Taliban officials have officially announced that women and girls are now expected to stay in their homes at all times. And if for some reason they must venture outside of their homes, they are required to cover themselves from head to toe. And that, friends, is a tragic and a blatant denial and rejection of the image of God. It is a literal attempt to cover up God's image and to expel it from the public square. And when that happens, it is not just the women who lose, it is everyone 
who loses because any banning or barring of the image of God from any sphere of human life is a step away from God's plans for us and for the world. Christian thinker and writer Caitlin Beatty sums it up so beautifully when she says this. She says, together they, male and female, bear the image of God. So when our cultural institutions only or primarily reflect the thinking and experience of one gender, we move further from God's intentions for his image bearers. And what women bring to the table is not simply a feminine touch, but half of humanity's gifts, passions, and experiences. And what amazing things those are. As a man, I am so deeply indebted to these gifts, passions, and experiences, and I'm so thankful for them. I'm thankful that I live at a time and in a culture when the gifts of God's female image bearers are increasingly used, valued, and celebrated. I'm grateful for the image bearers who have shaped my life, such as my mom and my grandmothers, both biological and those who have adopted me as a surrogate son or grandson over the years. I'm also thankful for the female professors, school teachers, Sunday school teachers, and Bible study leaders who have taught me, nurtured me, and formed me as a person and as a follower of Christ. I'm grateful for my female friends and classmates who over the years have been so patient with me, who have corrected me and called me out when I needed it, who have helped me to overcome blind spots in my life and see the world from other points of view. I'm also thankful for the female colleagues that I've had during my years in ministry, both in the church world and in the parachurch world, for the ways that they love Jesus and that they love people, for the ways that they inspire me with their creativity and their passion for serving God, for how I've been humbled to see the way that so many of them have worked to overcome challenges that I have never had to deal with for how they think of things that I would never think of and how they are so much better at certain things than I am. And I'm also grateful to be married to a woman who is so gracious with me, who puts up with me and tolerates things like my Star Wars references and obscure history quotes and the Legos and lightsabers and a hundred-year-old dusty books and other trappings of my life that she puts up with and who sets me straight and teaches me every single day in all of those ways that I just mentioned and more. Ladies, we men need you. Of course, you know that, but we want you to know that we know it too. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for all of the ways that you bring the gift of half of God's image to everything that you touch and do. You may not always know it or see it, but God is using you to change the world. So now that we've spent a little bit of time laying the biblical foundations and celebrating the gift of God's female image bearers, Let's zoom in on our passage, Luke chapter 10, and take a look at these two sisters whom Jesus loved dearly. Turning to Luke 10, verses at first 38 and 39, we read this. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, this is the first time that Mary and Martha appear in the Gospels. They also appear most famously, perhaps, in John chapter 11, when Jesus raises their brother Lazarus from the dead, and then briefly in John chapter 12, when they're all dining together and Mary comes in, she bathes Jesus' feet with perfume and then proceeds to wipe them off with her hair. And even though this family doesn't appear a whole lot in the Gospels, they are recurring characters. They appear more than many people do. And their friendship with Jesus was something that was special. We are told that Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Here's what else we know about them. Lazarus, as the male sibling, would probably have been seen in the eyes of the culture as the most important member of that family. 
Yet the Gospels tell us the least about him. In fact, other than telling us about how he was sick and then died and then raised back to life, the Gospel writers don't actually tell us very much at all about Lazarus. They say a lot more about Martha, though. She, we get the impression, is the mover and the shaker of this family. Martha is the one who opened up her home to Jesus. She's the one who takes charge. In the Gospels, she's the one that we see doing most of the talking, interacting with guests, and extending the gifts of hospitality to Jesus and to others. She's practically minded, and she shows love through her actions. In many ways, Martha really is the first century version of a Proverbs 31 woman. Mary, as Luke and John present her, is more quiet and more contemplative. Though she is more often found in the background of the narratives, when she steps into the foreground of the story, the gospel writers take notice and tell us about it. Mary is more of a Psalm 1 woman, like that tree planted by streams of water who bears fruit in season. She thinks deeply and she feels deeply. When she pours herself into something, she goes all in. It's also interesting what we don't know about this family. Luke and John never mention any other family members. We, we don't know, for instance, if any of them were married or if they had any children. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. In contrast to the culture of that time, the gospel writers don't really seem to care that much about that or think that this is the most important thing about them. And instead, according to Luke and John, what is the most important thing about Mary and Martha? It's their friendship with Jesus. It's the role that he had in their lives. That's what defines them in the eyes of Scripture. And so these sisters, they were very different from one another, but they both loved Jesus, and they both wanted to serve him. In this moment when he's staying in their house, they both make an effort to honor and to bless him. Martha was determined to show her love for Jesus through hospitality and through service. Mary, on the other hand, dropped everything else in order to be with him. Observing the distinct traits of each sister, Bible teacher J.C. Ryle says, the two sisters of whom we read in this passage were faithful disciples. Grace reigned in both hearts, but each showed the effect of grace at different times and in different ways. Both showed their love for Jesus, but they related to him differently. Yet he saw each of them and valued them both. Jesus' response to each sister is an affirmation of what each offers to him. Now, as we will see in a minute, Jesus offers Martha a word of correction. But we don't want to focus just on that and lose sight of the fact that Jesus accepts her hospitality. He receives it with gratitude here and in John chapter 12. He's grateful for her and for her love for him. And while we might think of Mary as the quiet and the passive one here, what she is doing in the eyes of her culture is incredibly bold. She is sitting and learning at the teacher's feet. In first century Jewish culture, who sits and learns at a rabbi's feet? Well, students, Bible students, male Bible students. Who doesn't sit at a rabbi's feet or even talk to a rabbi in public because it's considered inappropriate and beneath the rabbi to talk to them? Women, all women, period. So, in the eyes of the culture of that day, by sitting down and listening at Jesus' feet, Mary is doing something bold and radical. She's saying, I don't care what others may think of me. I want to be with Jesus. I want to hear what he has to say. I want to learn from the master. And, and by allowing Mary and even encouraging her to do this, Jesus is breaking all sorts of rules. So, so there Jesus is in this moment. He's teaching and he's enjoying being in this home marked by faith, love, and hospitality. Yet all is not well. In her effort to shower Jesus with the pomp and the circumstance that she feels that his visit requires, Martha is burning herself out. And this brings us to the next element in our passage, the burden that is felt by Martha and by many today. Continuing in verse 40, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, 
Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. So here's Martha's burden. She wants to serve Jesus well. She wants to treat him in a way that is fitting for who he is and for how much she cares about him. That's good. That's natural. That is commendable. Yet she is overwhelmed by the work that she has committed herself to. Little by little, Martha's starting to feel like she's falling behind. Her stress levels are beginning to rise. She's not sure if she's going to be able to attain the high standard that she has set for herself. And on top of that, she feels alone. She had counted on, or at least hoped for, some help from her sister. And each time, as Martha looks over, she sees Mary just sitting there, doing nothing. And at first, Martha perhaps feels annoyance. And then indignation, and then resentment. Doesn't her sister know how much there is that still needs to be done? Doesn't she care? Finally, Martha cannot keep it in any longer. Jesus, she says, stop distracting my sister. Make her help me. I cannot do this on my own. And that sense of helplessness, of indignation or resentment, this feeling of being trapped under a crushing load is something that perhaps many of us here today can relate to. This sense of staggering under a heavy burden, it can come in many ways and from many different sources. Pressure comes from all directions, sometimes from around us, sometimes from within us. And social media has not helped with this at all. It is so easy to go on Facebook or Instagram and plunge into the ocean of comparison, bombarded by pictures, posts, and videos that are carefully selected to show the very best of someone's life. In fact, sometimes what they show is actually maybe unrealistically better than what most of their lives might be like. But the consequence is that it makes So many of us feel inadequate when we see those things and compare ourselves to others. Wherever you go, it seems that you are pelted with the message, here's what you need to live up to. Here is what you need to achieve in order to really matter. And whatever the expectations, whether in the spheres of exercise or of physical appearance or of education or professional achievement, of marriage and romance, of motherhood or of grandmotherhood, it seems like the bar is always getting higher and farther and farther out of reach, but yet there are still those infuriating people who somehow manage to have it all and to do it all. One particular archetypal villain I keep hearing about is known as the Pinterest mom, an all-too-present but seemingly out-of-reach ideal that hounds many a millennial and Generation X mother. A a paradigm of of artsy overachievement, the Pinterest mom was described by one HuffPost writer like this. There's always that one who glitters things that don't necessarily need to be glittered, who decorates for every single holiday. Forget patting yourself on the back for festive window clings from the Target dollar spot. She has a chalkboard wall, a gallery wall, a pin board, and a coordinated mantle and entryway for every occasion. She hand-cuts themed washi tape, I don't even know what that is, into jack-o'-lantern faces for cups of yogurt dip for an after-school snack. She gleefully volunteers for every single crafty thing in your kid's class and coordinates it with, how freaking dare she, joy. In response to the Pinterest mom, another titan has risen up online, and that is the authentic mom. In contrast to the Pinterest mom, the authentic mom posts and rants about how imperfect and messy and out of control her life is. And while this can be a really refreshing alternative to this illusion of perfection that's elsewhere, it can also have the effect of creating pressure because now, what do you know, authenticity has become yet another standard to live up to. So if you're not being authentic and letting the world into your struggles, well then, now you're failing in a totally different kind of way. Now now all of you Pinterest moms and authentic moms out there, we love you and Jesus loves you but we all need the gospel here. 
But before we get ahead of ourselves, we don't want to forget that as prolific and ever-present as the Pinterest mom and the authentic mom seem to be, for Christian women, there's another far more ubiquitous and far more sinister stereotype. This one stalks the halls of women's conferences. It lurks behind the shelves of Christian bookstores, and it haunts many a women's Bible study. And this is the ultimate arch nemesis, the Proverbs 31 woman. (laughs) Many Christians have a complicated relationship with Proverbs 31. On the one hand, it's a beautiful passage, and it commends wonderful things. As the final chapter on the book of wisdom, this literary conclusion to the whole book of Proverbs, it personifies wisdom as the ideal woman. It's through Lady Wisdom and not Lady Folly that the good life is found. Yet, the words of this passage often become for many a standard that feels so hopelessly out of reach out of a genuine and commendable desire to imitate this description of wisdom and to celebrate the the impact that a godly and wise woman of faith can have, the church at times has unintentionally turned Proverbs 31 into one of the great guilt trip chapters of the Bible. So sadly, the good news of the freedom that wisdom brings is often turned upside down in our minds into a shopping list of all the things that godly women have to do and to be. And this list includes things like, and these are word-for-word quotations from the chapter, she gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family. She sets about her work vigorously. She sees that her trading is profitable. She grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. She makes coverings for her bed. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. And if she manages to pull all of this off, then she gets the reward of fame and recognition. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Now, God gave us this chapter as a blessing And there's much that we can learn from it. There's much that we can take away from it and bless our lives. But sadly, we have often turned this blessing into a curse because we turn it into another form of works righteousness. Ladies, when you read Proverbs 31, please don't feel that this has to be your job description or that this is the standard that God is calling you to achieve in every aspect of your life. God is not calling you to prove yourself by being sleep-deprived, stressed out, and frazzled all the time. He is not calling you to demonstrate godliness by mastering ancient Near Eastern household skills or by proving that you are the perfect Christian woman. Because Jesus didn't come to save perfect people. He came to save people who are imperfect and who need his grace each and every day. Jesus came to be your savior so that you wouldn't have to try to be your own kind of savior. You don't have to perform or achieve these things to have value and worth or to be called blessed because Jesus already calls you blessed simply because you are his, just as you are, tired and worn and imperfect. In Jesus Christ, you already have received everything that you need to stand before God and others with your head held high. Proverbs 31 is not your righteousness. It is not your identity. Jesus Christ is offered to you through the gospel. Friends, Jesus loves us too much to stand by and to watch us stagger under our burdens while we struggle to keep pace on the treadmill of life. He invites us, just as he invited Martha, to release those burdens, to turn off the treadmill. What our souls need most is not for us to do more and to be more and to accomplish more, but for Jesus to stop us in our tracks and reorder our frazzled hearts and overcrowded lives and to remind us what is most important. As he did with Martha, he pulls our focus back toward the one thing that is needed, back toward him. Jesus confronts Martha both firmly and tenderly in verses 41 and 42. He says, Martha, Martha, 
You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, Jesus here is not at all rebuking Martha's sense of calling or her gifts. He's not telling Martha to change who she is or to reject the things that God has placed in her life. He's not saying, Martha, why can't you just be more like your sister? He is simply asking her to let him in. Martha, he says, you're doing all of this for me, but you're not leaving any room for me in your life. What Jesus really wants from us is not our service or not the things that we do for him, as good and worthy and wonderful as they are, but what Jesus wants is you. He wants you to enter into his presence. He wants you to lay down your burdens and to be. And most of all, he wants you to be in his strong and gentle arms. In Jesus' response to Martha and to us, we find a twofold invitation, an invitation to release and an invitation to receive. Jesus invites us to release those things which are stealing our joy and keeping us from resting in him. For some of us, this may mean letting go of something. It may mean letting go of something that's devouring our time or ruling our heart or weighing down our mind. Have we overextended ourselves? Are we burning ourselves out trying to do something that Jesus hasn't actually called us to do? Maybe he is asking us to release that and to rest in him. But maybe there's not something that we can or should let go of right now. Perhaps our time and our energy are being spent exactly where they need to be. Maybe what Jesus is inviting us to release instead is an attitude or a mindset Maybe not what we're doing, but the way that we're doing it. Perhaps it's time for us to let go of the pressure that we feel, of our perceived need to prove ourselves, of our fear of imperfection or weakness, our aversion to the thought of letting people down. What would it look like for us to release part of our mental burden or the emotional load that we are carrying and give that to Jesus? Whatever Jesus may or may not be calling you to release, there are things that he longs for you to receive. First, Jesus invites you to receive him, to receive his grace and his acceptance. You don't have to prove yourself to him. Instead, you know, he doesn't ask you to be worthy. He asks you to come to him, to come to him as your savior and as your Lord, but also to come to him in all aspects of life for strength, for hope, for affirmation, for joy and comfort and peace. Second, Jesus invites you to receive his presence because you were never meant to do it alone. He longs to be with you in the quiet moments and in the chaos, in times of serenity and in times of stress, when you are alone with your thoughts and when you feel like you can't even hear yourself think because of everything that's happening around you. He wants to be with you in it all and through it all. Third, Jesus invites you to receive his vision for your day and his power in your life. He invites you to step back from the urgency of the moment and to allow him to show you his eternal perspective. He invites you to allow him to shift or reorder some of the things on your schedule and on your mind. What if the things that we think are important aren't as important as we think they are? Or what if they're important for different reasons entirely? What if the seemingly ordinary or mundane things in our lives are actually laden with a holy purpose that we are not aware of? What would happen if we opened our hearts and our minds and our schedules for the Holy Spirit to inhabit them in a richer and fuller way? And finally, Jesus invites you to receive his blessing in your life. Know that you are a child of God. Know that you do not have to measure up to a human standard or compare yourself to what other people are doing if you have found your rest in Christ. Jesus calls you to walk the path that he is calling you to walk, not that other people expect you to walk. And so wherever you are on that path, whether you're a stay-at-home mom or whether you're working full-time, whether you are married or single or divorced or widowed, whether your investment in the next generation is as a mom or an aunt or a teacher or a grandmother or a CEO or an advocate or a prayer warrior, 
Whether for you, Mother's Day is marked by joy, fatigue, longing, guilt, or regret, or regret, know this, that God is for you. Know that you have so much to offer for his glory and for the blessing of those around you. Know that you are God's beloved, and on you his favor rests. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence today and we acknowledge, Lord, the weights and the burdens that many of us are carrying. By your grace, Father, we ask that you would meet with us here today and that you would allow us to release those things. But most of all, Lord, we ask that you would open up our hearts to receive you in a new way. Lord, if if we're here this morning and we don't know you as Savior and Lord, then turn us from ourselves, turn us unto you. Let us lay everything down and follow you in repentance and faith. Lord, if there are other areas of our lives where your Spirit's power is ready to break through, then open our hearts to receive. Break through the walls and the boundaries in our hearts and in our minds. Lord, we ask that you would inhabit us, that you would help us to know you and to walk with you, that we might experience the joy of your presence and that we might know your love that will never let us go, that is without limitations, that is overflowing, that amazes us and transforms us each and every day of our lives. And we pray all of these things in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.